Um, good morning as well. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you to Prio for hosting um, and to Prio and Kristen Mickelson Institute and the United States Institute for Peace for being such fine partners. When you have uh, collaborators like uh, Christian, Arne, and Austri who have such deep knowledge of Afghanistan and also of peace processes around the world, one feels compelled to wear a suit to establish some gravitas, but um, they have been uh, incredibly valuable partners and collaborators in, in this effort. I might just start by talking a little bit about the context within which this work is taking place. Um, it began sort of in earnest uh, last September. But when the project was conceived approximately a year ago, there was quite a different environment uh, in respect to the possibilities for a, a peace process in Afghanistan. Um, there were some efforts uh, on the Afghan government side through a national consultative peace jirga in June, and that uh, uh, recommended and eventually was established a high peace council within Afghanistan. At the same time, there was the sort of early beginnings of a large joint Afghan government international program called the Afghanistan Peace and Reconciliation Program, um, which still is struggling to move along uh, effectively as a program, but represented a kind of effort particularly focused on what's become known as the reintegration process, which focuses on lower level uh, Taliban commanders and insurgents uh, and other armed groups and trying to get them to uh, make their peace with the Afghan government in some way in return for different kinds of programmatic interventions and employment opportunities uh, and other programs. I'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later. But in the fall, the, the landscape was definitely dominated by the military surge and by the arrival of General Petraeus in Afghanistan. Um, the US Defense Department's position and policies were definitely in the forward seat. Um, and as I said, the emphasis was on the reintegration side as well as a very intensified US military campaign of uh, targeted uh, capture and kill operations and um, uh, large military operations in Kandahar and Helmand in particular. There was in the fall a flurry of talks about talks um, but very little materialized out of that, most notably in a, uh, a fairly well-publicized fiasco regarding a, a, a person from Quetta who proved not to be who he said he was and was rather a shopkeeper and didn't represent the Taliban at all. Everyone at that time, when I began the work, spoke about the end of the winter, the beginning of the next fighting season in Afghanistan as a kind of inflection point or a point at which a litmus test of these policies would take place, and that's where we are now. And there certainly are some, some changes in the environment from then. The first is it is certainly true that there has been a, a massive military shift in the situation in the South. Um, but it doesn't seem to have dampened large Taliban attacks. It doesn't seem to have created a pervasive sense of security for citizens in the south of Afghanistan. It's also unclear if these gains are sustainable. A lot of them seem to be buttressed by extremely high and very intense levels of aid and attention in a few districts of the south uh, at the kind of levels that you couldn't possibly see reproduced widely across Afghanistan. There doesn't seem to be much progress on a sustainable Afghan governance component that would buttress those gains either. And so there's certainly questions about how the military situation has changed and how sustainable that is. The progress on this reintegration uh, in the absence of a broader peace process seems to probably not be working. Uh, if it's working, it's probably working in ways that make its contribution to a lasting peace unclear. Um, and the commentary, the sort of environment in Washington, say, is changing as well, in that there's a lot more commentary focusing on the need for US involvement in a political process and a peace process 
And quite emblematic of that, probably most emblematic, was the release of a report by Lakdar Brahimi and Thomas Pickering, known as the Century Foundation Report. It has a long title, but we can call it Brahimi Pickering, which very uh, robustly argued for the appointment of an international mediator, or the term they used was facilitator, to try to take forward a peace process with direct U.S. involvement as well. Um, U.S. government policy also is shifting. Um, the first major sign of that was Hillary Clinton's speech in New York at the Asia Society on the 18th of February. It was interesting that this was a speech at a, a memorial lecture for Richard Holbrooke, and it, um, it, it may signify as well that some of these changes in policy began to date before the death of Richard Holbrooke, but uh, came out into the public eye. That, the main point of that speech was that what had previously been somewhat ambiguously but understood by people as the U.S. position, which was that they had certain preconditions for uh, a negotiation to begin, that the Taliban would cut all its ties with al-Qaeda, would accept the Afghan constitution, et cetera, were now the conditions that a peace process should achieve. And that may seem like a semantic distinction, but it does seem to actually underlie a genuine policy shift. And recently, in the last few days, we've heard reports of talks directly between U.S. representatives and potential representative of the Taliban uh, in Qatar and in Germany. I have no special inside knowledge of any of those processes, what seems to be known and uh, what some experts have, have noted about this is that the person involved, Tayyab Aga, is a real person. And he was someone who worked very closely with Mullah Omar throughout the Taliban regime in his office. And uh, it, that he was also picked up for a period of time by the uh, Pakistani ISI at the same time last year that Mullah Baradar was packed up, was, was uh, temporarily incarcerated or invited to tea, as some say. Um, the speculation is that that was an effort by Pakistan to assert itself, its influence over the peace process. So there's certainly uh, reason for interest in these reports of talks in Germany. Um, and what it may signify is that the U.S. has accepted that it needs to take a direct role in negotiating with the Taliban, either in a shuttle diplomacy type way or face to face. And that was one of the main findings of this research, and so that gives us a good a good starting point to discuss the findings of the report. But maybe I should just take a, a moment to describe what this report is and where it, where it sits within the research process. Um, the first part of this research project uh, is represented in this report. And uh, it's basically a report on the findings of 122 interviews with uh, Afghan leaders from different spheres, political, economic, social spheres, religious spheres, about what the conflict is about now, why it has been getting worse, and what kind of challenges there are to a peace process. Other parts of the research that are ongoing are doing things like analyzing the Afghan media and the positions that have been expressed about a peace process, about negotiations in the Afghan media, and that how, how that ties into different interest groups. Um, and we also have ongoing research on the, this reintegration process that I, that I mentioned. Uh, there are going to be further stages to the research which will take some of the issues we're going to talk about today and look into them in much more detail. Again, testing out ideas and options with uh, Afghan opinion formers to find out what th seem to be ideas that have currency or could be realistic and what aren't. I think about the interviews, I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, the interviews were mainly focused on issues within Afghanistan, although, of course, Many people spoke about the regional issues about Pakistan and uh, about global uh, geopolitical questions, of course. The people interviewed are, we could say, elites. They are people who are leaders of, of have constituencies. It doesn't mean that they're only politically powerful people. Many civil society leaders, businessmen, and uh, religious leaders were also interviewed. Um, but I just want to say, this, pro this project, and I don't purport to represent Afghan views, the, the purpose of the project is to try and connect the issues that are being raised by Afghan leaders with the international policy debate, and also connect it with the academic debate and literature on peace processes. 
So that's just what I'd like to say there. A little bit about, I'll just leave that up there, but it, it, it shows the kind of range we have. Uh, some of the interview subjects, of course, fall into more than one of these categories, but there are a lot of political leaders, members of this High Peace Council that was created in September after about three months' delay, um, members of the government and opposition parties, uh, members of the former Taliban regime who uh, are retired, so to speak, um, as well as a few active commanders, mostly middle-level and low-level commanders, one uh, shadow district governor among those, and then some, some other uh, opinion formers within the society, businessmen, journalists, civil society representatives. So taking this uh, diverse group of people, of course, it's difficult to boil down any single position, but a few of the themes that come out are, are what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and the first is about how uh, Afghan leaders are understanding the conflict. And I just want to make two points first. One is that everybody talks about geopolitical, regional forces and factors. Pe there's almost nobody who doesn't talk about Pakistan and its role in the conflict. Many also talk about Iran and broader issues like competition between America and Iran, America and Russia, China and Russia, etc. But, and in addition, the conflict has a lot of local factors. The resurgence of the Taliban has diverse and complex local, tribal, and personal grievances that have driven in, uh, recruitment into the insurgency. The insurgency is made up of a network of networks, and different segments have different motivations and even different orient organizing principles. There are many di diverse stories of how the Taliban re-emerged in different parts of the country as there are Taliban commanders. But there's a lot of commonality to those narratives um, as well. But a growing body of research, people who've spoken with active Taliban commanders more than we have, and our own research, finds that the stated objectives of the Taliban basically consist of two things. The removal of foreign forces and Western influence and correcting an un-Islamic corrupt or predatory government. In the words of one commander, the Taliban's enemy is foreign troops and the, and the Afghan government. We're fighting with both. I'm fighting to release this Islamic country from these non-Muslim foreign troops, and the Taliban should win and make an Islamic government. What's important is from, from a lot of other in-depth research is that the Islamic narratives usually are, are to build on these grievances, these two grievances with foreign forces and the sense of occupation and uh, the um, weaknesses of the Afghan government. People are mobilized into the Taliban uh, in most cases, and then they are radicalized with the Islamic narratives, rather than having the Islamic narratives be the primary driver. This is, again, primarily within Afghanistan. The insurgents, which are coming from tribal areas in Pakistan, there may be a little bit of a different sequence there. What the interviews we did show is that this view isn't just the Taliban view. This view of the drivers of the conflict is shared with the government itself, when people speak privately, across civil society and, and the economy and among many political leaders. So I want to talk about these two broad areas, the sort of military question of foreign forces and the government situation and what the, the report says and what the interviews say about that. In terms of the military dimension, a key finding is that Afghans across all kinds of different groups perceive the United States as a belligerent with its own interests in the conflict rather than solely as a supporter of the Afghan government. They see a gap between the rhetoric and the reality of the U.S. role. One of the main belligerents in the conflict, the U.S. is prosecuting a military strategy which is independent of the Afghan government, but it claims it's not fighting for itself but supporting that government. At the same time, the Afghan government appears to be increasingly disavowing any interest in continued conflict. And so that gap calls into question the sincerity or the effectiveness of the U.S. emphasis on an Afghan-led peace process. In addition, among Afghans, there's still ambiguity over the withdrawal timetable for NATO troops. People note that 2011 was mentioned, 2014 was mentioned, different officials from different parts of the U.S. government and the international community still say different things. 
And so there's a lingering lack of cre credibility for U.S. claims to support a political solution. Um, and it would be interesting to see how that changes if, if these reports become more widespread. Um, but because the U.S. isn't seen as being fully committed, there's a lot of skepticism about any, the viability of a peace process because the U.S. is seen as such, playing such a principal role in the conflict. As another MP put it, for the mainstream, the U.S. are seen as a driver of the conflict, and the Taliban, from the Taliban side, the government is seen as irrelevant and a puppet. So the U.S. must engage directly in negotiating a peace settlement because it has control over the central issue that a settlement must address the withdrawal of NATO forces in return for a Taliban agreement on terrorism. While some leaders see negotiation as undesirable and continued military action as the only option, many believe that elaborating a clear framework for NATO withdrawal or even changes to military posture linked to steps by the Taliban on the prevention of terrorism might offer possibilities for a peace process. Even some leaders of vulnerable groups, ethnic minorities and women, for example, with the greatest concern over a deal for, with the Taliban, note that a withdrawal is necessary to make peace. The evidence from the Taliban side suggests that the full withdrawal of foreign forces also may not be necessary for a process to begin. Uh, Ex-Taliban leaders and pro prominent Hezbi Islami leaders suggest that changes to the operational patterns, seizing of aerial attacks, legal recognition, and clear timetables could form part of a settlement. It's important to say that doesn't mean those things have to happen unilaterally before a peace process begins, but that a framework for those things to happen has to form part of a settlement. For the part of active Taliban now, several operational commanders in both the North and the South suggested slightly in an ambiguous way that there are two interrelated things that would make them cease fire. One is an agreement on American withdrawal, and it's not clear whether that means it has to happen now or whether they see a framework for it, and a ceasefire order from Bullah Omar. All the Taliban commanders we spoke to uh, suggested that they still exist within a system of command and control that would, would require uh, orders from the top for them to lay down their arms. Now, that's a stated position. It may not be the real position, but it's important nevertheless. And here are some of the quotes about the, the, the US doubts or the doubts about the U.S. interest in peace, which uh, you know, is a challenge that needs to be overcome. Perhaps some steps to overcome it are beginning. I'm not going to leave them up too long, but they're all, and other quotes as well, are presented in the report. Here are a couple of Taliban commanders' views on withdrawal, and you can see there the interplay of these two positions. I myself want to be satisfied that there's going to be a withdrawal, but when exactly is ambiguous, and I also need orders from above. So the implication here is that the Taliban precondition of a withdrawal of foreign forces, which had been seen as a stumbling block, may be an opening negotiating position, not necessarily a precondition. I think a big challenge for a peace process will be how to leverage the current presence of NATO forces and linking them to the possibility of a structured drawdown that's connected to the necessary steps by insurgents. Right now, the withdrawal process is seen as disconnected or unilateral decision-making by NATO or by the United States. Just a moment about the, the current efforts under reintegration, because I think it's worth examining them. And we've got some research ongoing, but, but what we're finding so far is that, first of all, the people we spoke to here have a lot of doubts about the program. Uh, they suspect that it's being used as a patronage device to mainly uh, support insiders in the regime already and many of the groups that have been reported to reintegrate in the north in fact are, are reintegrating in order to gain uh, uh, acceptance and support from the government. None of the groups which have been reintegrating so far have laid down arms. Their condition has been that they can keep their arms and retain security responsibilities in their own areas. So in effect they are local commanders who are reintegrating on condition that they remain local commanders. And that sort of speaks to the question of whether the process really actually lays the groundwork for a sustainable peace. Um, there are a few signs of more significant changes, groups coming over, but I would say that those seem to be happening in spite of the APRP program, not because of them. They tend to be happening uh, on local initiative of governors, national security directorate, or ISAF personnel, 
And there's a big difference between how the program's viewed in the center in Kabul and in the provinces. In fact, many of the actors who are trying to negotiate these deals in the provinces would prefer that they don't get into the big system of the APRP because it's been so cumbersome and slow moving. And in fact, it was reported recently that the governor of Kandahar is asking Taliban commanders not to surrender yet, but to wait for a couple of months because the program isn't working well enough for him to be able to provide the support that's promised. I think given this partial picture of reintegration, at best a partial picture, one question on the military side that a peace process will have to address is a broader framework of demobilization or integration into the security forces for large groups of insurgents that won't hand over large tracts of territory to their free reign, but at the same time, it shouldn't provoke remilitarization by other groups. And I think that we haven't achieved that model yet. So that's a key agenda item that uh, there are perhaps different models around the world that can shed, shed light on that challenge. Um, I think whatever the military aspects of a, a peace agreement might look like, we need to take into account different scenarios for the international resources and will for a post-conflict international disarmament effort and peacekeeping effort. I think there could be questions about um, uh, the size of a peacekeeping force that might be available, and this at least needs to be also addressed uh, carefully. Um, in February, in, New in Washington, we presented some of these early findings, and the overwhelming one, as I say, was that the need was for a direct engagement by the U.S. If we take at face value that it may be appearing that this is starting to be taken seriously, then the question becomes, what kind of a peace process are we looking at? And here's where the political dimension of the results become interesting and are what I'll talk about now. The impression from many, many of the interviews is that the conflict in Afghanistan isn't only a struggle for power and resources between different interest groups, but it's also a legitimacy crisis which stems from a system of power and patronage that feeds the conflict. Um, these viewpoints connect the failings of the government to include worthy individuals not with a particular system of government but with the lack of any functioning system. And people speak a lot about the capture of the government among a, a very small elite who are working together to uh, pursue their ethnic and factional interests but also a range of other interests including criminal and economic interests that are very important. And the interconnection of the politics and the, the um, economic interests is perhaps uh, exemplified best by the, the scandal surrounding Kabul Bank, which has been emerging and about which new facts continue to emerge. Uh, recently, the estimates of the scale of the, the um, fraud that took place have been upped again, such that 94% of all loans that Kabul Bank ever made were uh, were completely fictional. They were loans uh, using, they were loans for no productive purpose and they were loans which were delivered to politically connected individuals, possibly uh, also for the purposes of political activities as well as, as economic activities. And this view is held even among key members of the government. Uh, it's not only a view from the outside, but it's a view from the inside. This quote from a senior government member uh, also illustrates this economic dimension that the capture of the government by uh, these individuals generates interests in continued conflict. So that when the Afghan government purports a, uh, uh, its support of a peace agreement and its peace process, it may be that not all, not all parts of the government are actually in their own uh, interested in that outcome. Secondly, that uh, ethnicity and other kinds of solidarity networks are an important mobilizing factor around which these interests can, can be used. And there's an interesting sort of pattern in the interviews where um, the very highest levels of sort of individuals who are most politically connected don't speak very much about ethnicity, but a whole range of people at the level of sort of members of parliaments see the conflict as becoming more deeply ethnicized more deeply sensitive along those lines. And everyone views that the 2010 parliamentary elections and the government's public discourse about a reconciliation process is, is deepening that ethnic uh, 
uh, uh, cleavage, that, that description of the conflict in ethnic terms. From this perspective, a, a peace settlement in Afghanistan must address the issue of reform if it's going to be sustainable. The question then becomes what kind of reforms? Most of the prescriptions in the interviews focus less on large-scale institutional restructuring of the state than they do on issues of balancing an oversized pre presidency and somehow increasing the legitimacy of appointments to the government through more transparent systems or, in the words of many people, the existence of any system at all. While different people interviewed have different criteria for, for leadership, could be experience and skills, national feeling, or moral and religious virtue, a recurrent theme across the boundaries is that when political deals or non-transparent criteria determine appointments, the nation suffers. There are also constituencies, uh, particularly among uh, politicians associated with uh, primarily minority political parties and the political opposition as it's being, being known now, for uh, broader decentralization or for an increase of uh, um, um, influence for the parliament or even a shift to a parliamentary system. And, but many of these people also um, emphasize fairly incremental reforms, such as stronger roles for local councils, the election of provincial governors from the provinces themselves, or as I said, more control by the parliament or a greater balance of, of uh, the branches of government. From the Taliban side, Reform proposals are, are pretty vague uh, as far as we can access them. They focus on the alleged un-Islamic character of the current system, but they also suggest kind of interest in reform rather than simply participation in, this, in the illegitimate system of power sharing. They're mentioned are the justice institutions and the defense institutions. The current model of the security sector is one which the Taliban possibly would like to reform. Um, one ex-Taliban official expressed the view that an Islamic regime could correspond to a presidential system, but that it needed to be balanced more with the Islamic principle of shura or consultation, or possibly some kind of guardianship to protect the Islamic nature of the system. Across the board, most stakeholders believe that constitutional reform should not be a barrier to peace, but also that it's not the most pressing issue. And many interviewees note that debates about the Constitution are already going on. And many paraphrased or repeated C President Karzai's own statement at the closing speech of the constitutional lawyer Jirga in 2004 that the Constitution is not the Koran. Uh, he said that to satisfy dissatisfied delegates who had voted for a parliamentary system at that time. The Taliban themselves haven't identified detailed demands, publicly at least, on preconditions, or in, in the interviews we did, on preconditions regarding the, the Constitution. And former Taliban officials maybe predictably underplay this issue when they're speaking to foreigners like myself. Um, some analysts suspect that they might want to create new institutions and or alter certain constitutional provisions in ways that would risk human and women's rights. But they might agree more modest or non-constitutional adjustments to institutions such as the Ministry of Hajj or educational curricula. Some ex-Taliban suggested that article, the articles of the Constitution that enshrine both Islamic and human rights could be preserved in order to build confidence. Some of the implications of these political findings is that a negotiation might occur, occur somewhere around the division between those constituencies that favor devolution as an opening for Taliban inclusion at local levels and the Taliban interest in changes to national structures, that that may be one of the dimensions of bargaining that could take place. A second implication is that a settlement might, but it also might not involve a radical restructuring of the state. A range of actors could find common ground in this diagnosis of a lack of balance in the presidential system uh, and suggest maybe a negotiating agenda which is around oversight and a focus on the procedures to address how people receive power and privileges. An early step of any process might be to clarify the indispensable elements of the Constitution and then consider the process for its amendment among other political arrangements on the negotiating agenda, but for a longer view. I think it's important to note here that there's a tension between this need for reform and the idea of power sharing, or particularly using political appointments, presidential appointments, to accommodate power sharing demands. 
by the Taliban or by other groups. To manage this tension, it may be that the, the peace process, at least among the Afghan parties, should be oriented towards broad inclusion of non-combatants, the identification of cross-cutting interests, while also balancing the, sequence, the secrecy which is required to avoid getting bogged down uh, with too many actors. And this is a, a, a difficult problem, but one that needs to be addressed. One way to do it is that uh, the exploration of multi-track models of diplomacy, civilian commissions in peace processes, the role of ombudspersons, national dialogues, and many other means of inclusion should be a priority. Uh, and these, these methods should be chosen for their ability to develop cross-cutting cross interests and make sure that they're represented in the peace process. An example of such a cross-cutting interest might lie among civil society, women, human rights activists, minorities, and some religious leaders. There's a broad current of opinion, as I said, that challenges the importance given to ethnic jihadi leaders and other insiders in the current power structures, and it stresses the need to include the concerns of victims and non-combatants in a settlement. If you combine that with growing youth, urban, and educated populations that would resist reversals of the post-2001 gains in civil and economic life, considerable forces have an interest in the broad consideration of rights, including those of women and girls, which if framed in appropriate terms, including Islamic ones, might form a common position that could influence a peace process. One question is whether the High Peace Council is equipped to take on that role as a kind of uh, part participatory institution. The interviewees widely see the High Peace Council as unsuited to mediate an, Af an intra-Afghan peace process, the discussions among Afghan groups. Um, but this was the role that had been intended by the delegates to the National Consultative Peace Jirga. Uh, they had recommended the creation of a broad-ranging neutral body, but that is not uh, how the vast majority of the people interviewed seed the body that was appointed. This is not only because it includes many former enemies of the Taliban and many uh, 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 of the leaders who are seen as part of this uh, system of capture of the government, but also even because of the number of Taliban that are included on it. There was a question raised by interviewees that people who are ex-Taliban may not be the best people to, to use to represent Taliban views, that the Taliban connection to those people may actually be weaker or more confrontational than we assume uh, when, we, when we take on the model of saying that, that if you can't speak to a Taliban, speak to an ex-Taliban. That may not necessarily be, be an accurate way. People also view that, and, and it seems clear from the way that talks are going on so far, that the High Peace Council is unlikely to be empowered to be the government delegation. Many members of the High Peace Council see themselves in that role, that they will represent or channel the demands of the insurgents to the government and make recommendations about what should, should be accepted and not accepted. It seems likely that actually the control over that process will be retained within the presidential palace. So perhaps the best role for the High Peace Council may be to form part of a range of these inclusive measures, but not the only one, and try to advise and generate proposals for a peace process. I'm going to close now with just a couple of the findings about the, uh, the actual possibilities of uh, how a peace process might be structured. And these are, I think, the kinds of questions that actually we really want to take forward in the future stages of the research. So they're a bit more speculative. But in order to balance this tension between secrecy and inclusion, the substantive peace talks might take place with parallel tracks. There might be a military table which focuses on steps to achieve and maintain ceasefires, create interim security arrangements, and generate this linked framework for withdrawal with the prevention of terrorism and all the measures that would be needed to verify or guarantee that. These talks would primarily involve the US, the Afghan government, and the networks that make up the insurgency, possibly with representatives of neighboring powers, and of course other NATO governments and they would have to feature a higher level of confidentiality. But a parallel process with, of political and social negotiation might involve wider inclusion of the Afghan groups alongside the government and insurgents, 
with mediation or input from respected figures from within or from outside Afghanistan, particularly those with legitimate Islamic credentials and reputation. This process might be able to draw upon references to the customary dispute resolution practices of Afghanistan that a lot of the interviewees raised. In particular, the importance of the mutual acceptance of mediating arrangements by both parties. Um, and for that reason, when talking about the logistics and the practicalities of a peace process among Afghans, many of the interviewees said the location or who exactly the mediator is, is less important than that it be accepted by all the parties involved. This model is a little bit different than the policy proposals, for example, in the Brahimi Pickering Report, which emphasizes the need for the U.S. to push for a U.N.-mandated uh, international mediator and facilitator, although that may be very important when we talk about the regional dimension of the negotiation or the military table. Um, an, an alternative structure would be to negotiate in sequences, addressing different issues step by step and building upon them uh, with varying participation. Um, the advantage of this approach might be that you could tackle more tractable and easier to resolve issues first to build confidence and momentum and later resolve tough ones. Or the most important questions could be, could be tackled in a framework agreement initially. Regardless of the structure, it's probably important to seek near the outside a kind of guiding framework that might set basic principles if these can be agreed. These might involve the independence of Afghanistan from foreign interference, the prevention of its use for terrorism, the gradual withdrawal of foreign forces as the agreed end goal, um, the preservation of key principles, rights, and protections, key articles of the Constitution, etc. The framework agreement might also establish some procedures for setting up those mediation arrangements for talks among the Afghan parties and to get that element of mutual acceptance before you begin. Both of these models, and they're not the only ones available, suggest a slightly more drawn out process than uh, a big bang peace conference, a Dayton type model, and probably would be more resilient to the kinds of inevitable setbacks that a peace process would involve. And that's something perhaps to consider. A last sort of interesting point um, about the interviews as well, that there was fairly widespread support still for the necessity and even the legitimacy of, of elections as s the transition from interim measures that a peace process would have to set up to a longer term situation. Lots of people talked about serious problems with the elections that have been held, but the concept of elections, even among Taliban, operational Taliban commanders, as you can see here, was accepted, not just by one or two, but by several. Um, and I think that's an interesting point to bear in mind. Other transitional measures that were mentioned, because clearly holding elections in Afghanistan is a very, very difficult thing to do well and has created as many problems as it's solved, to put it mildly, um, was the use of indirect selection measures similar to those used in the emergency loya jirga uh, earlier in the bond process. That me mechanism is still seen as quite legitimate by, by many actors because it drew upon representatives from all districts of the country. So this, those are some options that may be available there. I think I'll stop there because that describes some of the main findings. We go into more detail in them, on them in the report. There's a, we've tried to use as much of the texture of the quotations in the report as well. I hope you find it interesting reading. Um, but uh, I think now it's probably a good time to give over the floor for some, some questions. And uh, I look forward to those from my colleagues and from yourselves as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Hamish. Um, it's not my role here to uh, be uh, the critical discussant, the uh, person to butcher Hamish's report. That would partly be unfair because I've actually been given the privilege of both reading and commenting upon it, and I find myself as being in great sympathy with, uh, uh, with the uh, conclusions that Hamish reaches. Um, so I think that would be, um, be non-constructive. But let me see if I can add a little bit uh, with a view to where we are standing at the current. 
Uh, and of course, looking into the crystal ball right now when it comes to Afghanistan is rather difficult because what we see is really a rumor bazaar. There are uh, many things that we don't know, and it may even be that those things that we think we know will prove to be entirely wrong. As a reminder, we can think about the incident last fall when uh, there were uh, strong rumors in the international press about the series of negotiations going on. And Maybe there was, but suddenly the news broke that the person representing the Taliban proved to be uh, somebody just posing as a Taliban and uh, having been taken for what he claimed to be, whereas intelligence failed to reveal him. Um, <coughs> Hamish mentioned this. There uh, are now very strong indications that there is a series of talks going on, uh, facilitated by the Germans. Uh, between uh, the uh, US and the Taliban and uh, with some Afghan involvement, some Afghan government involvement, although the nature of the latter is uh, uh, somewhat vague in the news reports that have been coming out. Uh, there has been a meeting in Qatar followed by one or several meetings in Germany reportedly. Uh, we don't know much, though, about the content of these meetings. I think we can take it for granted that what we are seeing currently is confidence-building measures really agreeing on agreeing to meet and perhaps starting to discuss uh, ways in which confidence can be strengthened further, but not much more than that. That doesn't mean that the ambition ambitions don't reach much further than that. I think we can take it for granted if what we hear from the press is true, that the ambition here is to lead towards a meeting in Bonn, 10 years after the uh, Bonn conference uh, in 2001, where, uh, if not necessarily the Big Bang that uh, Hamish alluded to, the ambition is to really have something significant to report. So that is the one really significant news of peace, uh, the piece of news when it comes to Afghanistan at the current. The other interesting uh, piece of news that has es escaped none of us is, of course, the killing of bin Laden in Pakistan. And there have been numerous speculations about what impact that will have. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat them all, but I do think it's interesting to speculate on the impact of uh, uh, bin Laden's uh, departure on uh, the regional aspects of, um, of the uh, Afghan situation. Now, our project is first and foremost about domestic perceptions. Uh, and certainly, uh, the killing of bin Laden may have an impact on domestic perceptions. But I don't think that is where the bin Laden uh, killing may be most significant. I think it's more significant internationally. And when it comes to the region, there are a couple of very clear implications. And I think the clearest of these implications is that this is, if anybody has doubted it, the final evidence that uh, the US uh, sees it in its interest to keep bases in Afghanistan for the long term, and that those bases are a successful, if not even a necessary instrument for projecting American power throughout the region. And I think with the killing of bin Laden, that message is not lost on any of Afghanistan's neighbors. And this has repeatedly been stated as one of the implications of the killing of bin Laden, for example, in the US Senate. Um, so that's one, that's the clearest implication. But the other implication, which is somewhat more speculative, but nonetheless interesting, I think, in the regional context, it what does, this does to uh, the various uh, political conflicts playing out in the neighboring countries. If we look, for example, at the countries of Central Asia, they have been pursuing in recent years uh, a war on terror on their own terms against insurgents within their own countries. The war on terror is big in Central Asia. It certainly also is a conceptual type of apparatus that has been picked up by other neighboring countries. But what now if the killing of bin Laden leads to a redefinition of what this is about? In fact, that re redefinition has already started, of course, with Obama insisting that uh, uh, the war on terror is not uh, necessarily the main thing anymore. At least he has shielded the concept. But I think with bin Laden's departure, uh, 
uh, that reconceptualization uh, gains further strength and perhaps even further uh, political stature. Uh, and that uh, creates a rather interesting dilemma, I think, in the region where many of the countries have, uh, in, in fact, staked their own fights against the insurgents on the very conceptualization inherent in the US strategy, uh, US led strategy, I should say, from 2001. So uh, Hamish, towards the end, uh, started to delineate some of the issues about how to see a process as we move forward. And I mentioned already that one thing that we see at the current is a Taliban-US negotiation. Certainly something that would please many within the Taliban who have consistently argued that a negotiation has to be with the US. But there is an Afghan role in there and we don't know exactly what that role is. The second track that we see unfolding at the moment is a Pak Pakistani-Afghan-US negotiation. So we already here see how true the two tracks are set up in parallel. And of course it's a clear ambition from the US side to separate between the track that involves the Pakistanis and the track that involves the Taliban. Now it will be a critical question I think as we move ahead how successful that separation is. The question has been raised for example whether the <coughs> the individual that has allegedly been representing Mullah Umar in the talks in Qadar and Bonn also like many of the old many of the other uh, 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 Taliban converts and non-converts have their family under, under Pakistani <coughs> protection. Now that possibly gives the Pakistanis a bit of a grip on how uh, Mullah Umar's representative acts in those negotiations and whom it is that he reports to in uh, what manner. So I think the track issue is a very interesting one. Uh, I think you also made interesting observations, Hamish, about um, the timing, the sequencing uh, of talks as we move forward. And uh, to be as short as I intended, let me conclude on not only the uh, tracking and the timing, but also on the uh, opening of space. Uh, space for civil society, space for those groups who don't currently hold military or political power in Afghanistan, but may have very valuable use and may certainly, uh, uh, will certainly have to live with the implications of whatever is agreed. And here there is a real dilemma which has been pointed out by many, or there are several real dilemmas. One dilemma is, of course, the uh, dilemma between what the parties may see as a need for secrecy and what civil society will see as a need for openness in order to be able to engage. But there is also another dilemma which we less often talk about, and that is the dilemma of what happens to some of the critical civil society concerns if we load them into a peace negotiation process which is already very complicated. It has been raised by some, not so many in, amongst our Afghan uh, conversation partners I think, but uh, certainly by observers with experience from other peace processes, that if you load some of those most difficult human rights issues, democracy issues into a negotiation process that is already complicated, that may have a larger cost than gain you may end up having to sell out on a number of critical issues, whereas if you hadn't loaded those issues into the process, uh, kept them open, kept them open for normal processes or political bargaining in the longer term, you would actually have done less harm to those issues than if you put them into uh, a peace process that is ultimately going to be very strained. So with that uh, little food for thought, I want to end my comments and hand it over to Astri. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll be even briefer because there have been lots of interesting questions out there I'm sure you want to pursue. Uh, first of all, let me say, hey, may you done a marvelous job. Uh, this is a very interesting report, very rich, important material. I hope you all have a chance to read it. Do, do read it. Um, I want to make one basic point. We are clearly moving towards some form of negotiations. 
But then remember the uncertainty principle that you cannot know both the speed and the position of a body at the same time. So we now know we are moving towards negotiations, but we don't know the positions of the various parties. Uh, and there's lots of flurry of speculations uh, going on uh, about positions. And we cannot really know positions <laughs> because positions are made during negotiations. So this is a moving target. Um, but, uh, and, and that we should keep in mind. Um, but what are the implications of uncertainty on the parties involved? And I, I think that's something we should think about. Uh, within Afghanistan, I understand, there is an enormous and deep sense of uncertainty about the future. What is going to happen? I mean, there are a couple of years. 2014 is an important year. Uh, July, this year, is an important year relating to American schedules. Uh, but who is going to do what and what the future is going to be is really fairly open-ended, according to many. Now, what do you do in that situation? Um, I think you... Uh, resort to various kinds of coping and hedging strategies. And maybe we should see the Kabul bank story partly in that context. You have a short time horizon. You need to increase security. Uh, you take larger risks. Uh, you probably move to groups, uh, the primordial groups that are important, we can probably expect a further intensification of ethnic ties and solidarity groups, uh, uh, the groups that can provide security. Uh, so this is also characteristic of the pre-negotiation phase. Insecurity, a scramble for more security, for gains, for hedging, uh, but also, in that sense, a hardening of conditions. Uh, so there are contradictory forces at work here. Um, what are the implications for us, we outside, who are concerned with Afghanistan? Um, if we take NATO as sort of one entity, which of course it is not, uh, one important aspect is that the US and the NATO leadership probably, as both of you alluded to, knows much less than they would like to know about who is who on the Afghan scene, and who are the peace actors, and who are the conflict actors, and what their positions are. Uh, so uh, that's one point. Even more problematic is that there is a deep mistrust between the US and its allies on the one hand, and the Afghan government on the other side. And that's going to make negotiations even more difficult and more problematic. So on our side, if you can say we NATO, which I normally don't say, <laughs> uh, is patience, knowledge, and we are contributing in our own little way to the knowledge picture here, uh, is very important. And if I can put in my own sort of two-bit uh, advice on peace process, uh, <clears throat> with great uncertainty, with very considerable opposition and contradictions uh, and distance among the parties, you might want to look to uh, a framework agreement that develops over time. Uh, take the Guatemala model that Norway was involved in, by the way, as you know. Uh, where you start with framework principles, but they are very general so that everyone can agree, but it doesn't mean anything very much. Uh, and then over time, and then you also set out the procedures, as you said, in uh, pr principles and procedures go into the framework agreement. And then over time, you, you don't overload, because as you said, if you overload, the whole thing may collapse. But then you work towards some kind of set of agreements. That's what I did in Guatemala. And of course, in Guatemala, you had enormous distance opposition as well, and fundamental opposition. Uh, I mean, 30 years war in Guatemala as well. So maybe we should look to Guatemala. 
you know, in the end, they got a peace, uh, and it turned out to be a fairly violent peace. <laughs> and most of the very nice principles were unfortunately not implemented, but it was better than the war they had. Um, so I think um, on that note, uh, I will close. That wasn't very encouraging, was it, <laughs> in terms of the future? Thank you very much to Austria and to Chris.